Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Today's guest is Dana O'Driscoll. I absolutely loved our conversation as we dived into the heart of herbal medicine and how it's a vibrant living tradition. You'll also hear how Dana was able to heal her chronic asthma by working with plants. I know from my years of being a clinical practitioner that this isn't an uncommon experience. Plants are so powerful. I also wanna remind folks that when working with plants for complex issues, like asthma, it's always best to work directly with a practitioner who can help you get the best results safely. For those of you who don't already know Dana, she spent most of her childhood in the wooded hills of the Laurel Highland region of Pennsylvania, making mud pies, building brush cabins, and eating berries. Thankfully, little has changed, and she can still be found searching out tasty mushrooms, gathering herbs, and playing her pan flute for the trees. As an artist, permaculture designer, herbalist, and druid, Dana weaves creative practices with her love of plants and the natural world. Dana's lifelong goal is to help envision an earth-honoring, care-filled future where humans can return into natural balance with the earth. Dana is currently the Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America, and also is a Druid in the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. Her book, Sacred Actions, Living the Wheel of the Year Through the Earth-Centered Sustainable Practices, was released by Red Feather in 2021. She also is the author and illustrator of the Plant Spirit Oracle and the Tarot of Trees. Welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, Dana. Thank you. I am so thrilled to have you here. I have to tell folks that this was kind of like a little bit of a last minute booking because I recently found out about your book, and then I really wanted to have you air over this time of Samhain. So I'm so glad that you were able to fit us in and be here uh, on the podcast. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'd love to start by hearing about how you found yourself on this beautiful plant path. Absolutely. Um, so... I, um, I've always loved plants um, and I've always been, um, when I grew up as a child, my grandfather used to take me into the woods and teach me about different plants, but it really wasn't until I actually faced a serious health condition that I actually realized the power of plants and the power of plant healing. I had gotten out of graduate school and I was teaching at my first job and I was in Southeast Michigan and I have always had a chronic asthma, uh, asthma my entire life. And it was sort of like getting worse and worse as I went along. And by the time I found myself in my first teaching job, I had literally been on four different daily medications plus the fast acting inhaler plus the nebulizer. And it got to the point where when I would take these, <laughs> my body would start to shake and I'd get really jittery. and. I was having like this, like several hour a day reaction to these things. And I sort of sat down with myself and I'm like, okay, like this is starting to get to the point where it's impacting my quality of life. And what do I do? And a friend of mine had just finished Jim McDonald's uh, four season. He called it the four season herbal intensive at that point. It's now called Lindera. Um, and my friend was like, Hey, you know, I should introduce you to Jim McDonald and you should, you should work with him because he might be able to help you. And I was like, Hey, listen, at this point, I'm willing to try anything. I love plants. I was already a druid at that point. So, you know, I was already thinking about my you know, nature and spirituality and how those things tied. So I, I got an appointment with Jim and Jim's like, Hey, well, you don't want to take a, you want to take a hike or something. And, you know, I know you're a Druid. And so we ended up like hiking out to the stone circle and sitting and I was telling him about my asthma. And he's like, you know, I've been working with the Astor family and there's all of this old 
um, knowledge in these old books like King's Dispensary and so on, but we don't, we've lost a lot of this knowledge and there's a plant that I think might really help you with your asthma. And I was like, okay, I'm willing to try it. He's like, but you're going to be a guinea pig, <laughs> you know, because because there's no, the modern herbalism doesn't really use this plant. He's like, it's New England Aster. And I was like, I'll try anything, Jim. And he's like, okay, great. I need some guinea pigs. So um, he gave me a, a, tinct, a bottle of tincture and I started taking it. Almost immediately, I had immediate relief. Within a week, I started dropping the asthma medicines. Within three months, I was completely off of all of them. And I had made some diet changes at the same time. I had reduced greatly my consumption of gluten because I found that that was also um, so between those two changes, I managed to get off of what I had thought would be lifetime medication for asthma. And of course, Jim was absolutely through the moon and I was too. And I'm like, well, I've got to really start learning this plant. And we're going to talk about it tonight, which is part of why I want to talk about this plant because I think it's an interesting story. After that, you know, I went to my doctor and, you know, she's like, okay, well, let's get, let's like put all these, give you all these medications again. And I'm like, no, you know, I don't actually need them. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine without them. And, you know, it was this really like, crazy thing because my doctor was like, no, no, Dana, you're going to die without these. And I'm like, no, really, I'm living without them, you know? And after that, I decided I was going to enroll in Jim's four season herbal intensive course. And then I took a whole bunch of other classes while I was still in Michigan and, you know, started my lifelong journey into herbalism. And that was like, I want to say 12 or 13 years ago now. And when I came back here to Western Pennsylvania, there was a lot, there was very few people teaching herbalism. So I started doing some teaching and one of the plants I started working with people with was New England Aster. And so, you know, I really like, I'm really grateful that we have this beautiful herbal community here in the United States, um, that we have people we can learn from and we have alternatives because my life personally has gotten so much better since I was able to manage everything with herbs. It's also deepened my relationship with plants and with plant spirits and all of those other things that I really care about. So I think that's a, a, a good introduction to how I became an herbalist. <laughs> that's a fabulous introduction. Yeah, I love that you were a, sex, a successful guinea pig for <laughs> Jim and New England Aster. I also just like, I just have to acknowledge for a second, like, I don't, if people don't know, Jim is one of my dearest friends. So I am somewhat biased. But how cool is that, that you have a consultation with a herbalist and he's like, let's go on a hike. Let's go to a yeah. circle. <laughs> so that's yeah. awesome as well. And, you know, there's something that I don't think about a lot, but as you were talking, I was just reminded, I had such a similar story in that I, throughout my teenage years, was on two different allergy medications myself. And it was horrible if I didn't take them, horrible when I did take them, you know, it was mm -hmm. like this, like, almost like a hate, hate situation in that. And plants are what helped me get rid of, like, I haven't had allergy symptoms now in years. So like two, yeah. two decades, really. So yeah, that, I um, feel like that's a common story. Like when you talk about how people came in, it's often like from your own embodied experience. And, you know, regardless of like what science says or anything else or what allopathic medicine says, like nobody can deny that experience. Nobody can deny the fact that like that radically changed for me and that radically changed for you. So it's like, why wouldn't I want to use more plant medicine? I've already had like an, an enormous, rep, you know, an enormous uh, change in my life for the better. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's so important that sort of those individual experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, that embodiment, because once we have that, there's just no forgetting it. It changes us forever. So are you ready to dive deeper into New England Aster? Yes, please. All right, let's do it. So yeah, New England Aster. So that was sort of my first plant I really worked with. And later, but you know, both as a, as a, as someone is a patient, and then later as an herbalist, and I actually have my my glycerate going here. Um, and actually, this has been about a month. I'm ready to pull this out um, this um, this weekend. And so, you know, just to talk a little bit about New England Aster, it's a late blooming deep purple aster. I know we're going to share some pictures as well that primarily, I know most of the way that I've used it is um, working with the lungs. Um, it does have some other uses, but I think over time, you know, with Jim and his students and other people who started working with it, a lot of us understand it as like a tropo restorative for the lungs. So it has both a sort of a fast acting, like I can literally use this in place of a fast acting inhaler. And so if I'm having wheezing or difficulty, it immediately has effect. But I also, as you take it over time, it almost like builds and bolsters your lungs, it sustains them, which I think is really useful. So, you know, if you're thinking about like tightness of breath and wheezing, um, seasonal allergies, it's really, really good for seasonal allergies, especially if you're combining it with something else like goldenrod or ragweed or something like that. And I think the other thing it has is it's got a bit of a nervine kind of mellowing quality. So if you think about like some people who have asthma 
or you know you get upset and one of the things that you do is you start breathing deeply and you <sighs> and that's one of the plants that can just sort of like okay let's mm. just calm um and so those are some of the qualities that i think it really really works well for and of course now we're in the season we've got all of this covid and all of these lung conditions and you know it's another it's a perfect plant to help support our lungs and strengthen them. And if, you know, we get sick in that way, um, support us there too. And then of course you can combine it with other things. Like um, I use it a lot with pleurisy root or with mm -hmm. um, Ella campaign, especially if you get like a bronchitis or emphysema or some kind of damp wet lung condition. Um, and, you know, it can, it can be combined with like herbal steams and all sorts of things. Um, but it's just truly, truly a magnificent plant for those uses. And I don't think that like it's different than mullen or ella campaign or pleurisy, some of our other really good lung herbs and that it does have that sort of like long-term sustaining um, piece to it, I think. Mm. I was just thinking about how it has this long-term sustaining factor for so many pollinators. Because mm -hmm. right now it is pretty much, it is one of the only plants in my garden that's blooming. I live in zone four, so we've already had our hard frost. So much of the garden has died back. There's a couple things still, you know, surviving through the frost, but by far the most vibrant thing right now in the garden are these large clumps of New England aster. Uh, I bought like one little plant of New England aster, like maybe 10 years ago. And the person I bought it from was a local nursery. And she told me like, it likes to spread, but I don't think that she really like gave the superlative nature of it spreading like <laughs> its full respect. And, uh, I lived in a different place then, had a different garden. I moved a clump of that with me to this new garden. And I actually, I had like three clumps. And so I just planted them around the garden. Now I have like huge, you know, stands of this beautiful plant. And right now it's blooming so vibrantly and the pollinators are all over it. We have our own hives. Um, it's actually a friend of ours tends to them, but they're on the property. Then we have so many different bumblebees and native bees and um, they're all out there just feasting away. And it's such an important late food for these yeah. pollinators. So just that long-term sustaining mm -hmm. for our lungs, for the pollinators, all of it. Yeah. And I feel like, have you ever watched, um, I don't know if you look at the aster really closely, like has this way when it's a bud of like opening up like this, which is like how, when I feel like I'm breathing out and oh, then yeah. whenever it goes it, whenever it starts dying off to go to seed, it like curls in on itself in these like beautiful spirals. Every little leaf like comes back in. And it almost reminds me of like, it's like, it's like mm -hmm. exhaling and then it's like inhaling. And it's, it's like, it's just so, it's just such an incredible plant when you like, I like if you take like a jeweler's loop and like look at it really close. Oh, it's just like magnificent. <laughs> I love that, Dana. I know exactly what you're talking about because I do spend a lot of time looking at New England Aster, but I've never really... I'm like understanding what you're describing because I've seen it, but I really hadn't thought about it like that. And that is something I will never forget now because that's a oh. really like when you hear things that you just know are, are a revealing of truth. <laughs> like that is definitely like, it. oh, yeah, I see it's that. Like that. Like that, just like the time we spend in like deep observation of plants and even thinking about like the doctrine of signatures, you know, and just that like what can we learn just by seeing them or smelling them and i feel like the more that i do that even if i think I, like a, like doing the naster i i know it so well but every time i visit the plant i feel like i learn something new and there's like that mm -hmm. exchange and that communication happening yeah yeah so i haven't worked with it a lot myself beyond admiration um and but i have like done little things here and there i know that it's important to work with the medicine fresh and so Oftentimes it is as a tincture or as you mentioned, a glycerite, which is the recipe yes. that we have to share from you. Yes. Why don't you just talk about a little bit about that, you know, kind of medicine and maybe, you know, the importance of it being fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, some of the experiments that you know, a number of us have been doing with the New England Aster do have to do with like, okay, well, can you make it into a tea? Can you freeze it? Sort of all of the typical herbal treatments. And I think the general consensus, and this is certainly what I have found, is that you really do want to tincture it fresh. Um, you either tincture it, um, you can make a vinegar, but 
I don't really think the vinegar tastes great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can make a glycerate. And I prefer the glycerate just for my daily use because um, I go through it so often. And what I usually like to do is once I have the glycerate, I'll just like fill my water bottle up in the morning, morning and put a few squirts in it. And then I'm getting it throughout the day, um, which mm -hmm. for me is important for my condition. So yeah, um, one of those. And I, like I said, I, I just like the glycerate. So I thought I would share that. So, you know, one of the things I did want to share about this plant too, um, especially for people who would be using it like daily or, you know, as a regular restorative is I do think it's really important to develop a really specific relationship if you can with the plant mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, just, we don't just walk up and like cut it off and start harvesting it. Right. I sort of like to build um, connection and gratitude. So come to the plant throughout the season, you know, if you're harvesting it wild or if you're growing it in your garden, you know, express your gratitude, sit with the plant, learn, learn about the plant. And I also like to make some kind of exchange or offering um, in that maybe I could offer a pinch of pinch of herbs, but for plants, especially like that, like a native wild plant, gathering the seeds, sharing them with other people, spreading the seeds to me is a way of saying, thank you for the medicine that you're providing. And thank you for allowing me to be healed. And so as part of the harvest, um, and I think as part of the medicine of the plant, which is part of what I wrote in the recipe, I think it's important to find a way of sort of building that reciprocal connection with it, of, or of course, getting it from an herbalist who has done that work so that that medicine is even more potent. So yeah, so go to your plant, get it when it's in full bloom, really, you know, sunny, bright day. New England, there's there's a, a number of purple asters like here. I'm on, I'm in Western Pennsylvania um, on the East Coast. And so if you are looking for it in the wild, you're going to want to look for that deep purple with that yellow and yellow and orange center. And you're going to want it to have a really strong aromatic smell. It's like a really, I don't know how you describe it. Like a, a light. I don't know. Do you have a, do you have a yeah, word? That's a tough one. one. Yeah. I know, it's like so unique, mm -hmm. um, like a slightly floral, but maybe like richer undertone. I don't know. I'm, I'm not doing, there, there's not English words to describe this, <laughs> this, this smell, um, but you'll see, you'll get a really strong scent. And then, Often, um, just like St. John's, the, there's going to be a little bit of stickiness um, when it's a really good um, plant. Around here, we have a lighter colored aster, which is actually like a forest aster that's like a light purple, which is not the same and doesn't work the same. Um, so I really want to stress like trying to find that that stickiness and that aromatic because I think the, a lot of the medicine is coming from that aromatic quality. So, um, you know, my general recipe is um, about two and a half cups to three cups of the flowering tops. And if you get a little bit of leaves, it's okay, but you're really going for those flowering tops. Um, and, and you pick them and then you take them and, you know, you can either use um, a quart mason jar or you can use a pint if you want to just really press it in um, and push it all in. And then I add two cups of glycerate and a cup of water, or you could just do the folk method and pour a bunch of alcohol over there then, um, if you're doing a traditional tincture. But the two cups of, of vegetable glycerin to one cup of water seems to be a really good ratio. And I think that's going to end up where you want to be about 50, 50, because you've also got the water from the plant. And then as you, um, so it's going to start out like really deep purple. And then as you um, work with it, you're going to see the glycerin, let's see if I can show this, it's going to, because this one's done. So I was saving this one to show um, the glycerin is eventually going to take on kind of this like purplish brown and you're going to see that the flower heads are going to kind of go less purple and they're like once they get to the point where they're sort of brown and they're lost their vi vibrancy it usually takes about a month and you know then you're going to um be ready and of course you want to shake it up every day and sort of interact with it as it as you're making this medicine and then once that's done um so probably tomorrow or this weekend sometime I will go ahead and strain it and straining it really carefully to make sure I get all the plant matter out and then store your glycerate in a cool dark place and use it at will and of course the glycerate doesn't have a um it doesn't you know it has got about a year to year and a half shelf life um i make this every year so as i said i like the glycerate because i put it in my tea and in my water and it's like a good way for me to take it i'm not a great mm -hmm. <laughs> despite the fact that i'm an herbalist i'm not a great fan of the taste of alcohol so for something i take every day i have found this is good and also if you have children this is really really good for kids this particular so yeah fresh as fresh is important um one thing i want to mention is the um aster has a tendency to go to seed really quickly like within <laughs> sometimes five or six hours within 12 hours so you want to harvest this and within a couple of hours you want to prepare it so that you get that full 
vibrancy of, of it. Um, and then of course, if it goes to seed, you can try to make a tea or something. I mean, we've experimented with like freezing it and making it a tea, but in the end, this is just, is just the best preparation for it. I love that you're mentioning experiments with it. Cause as you mentioned in the first part is that this is, this is a plant that's been worked with for a long time as medicine, but in modern times, a lot of us don't have this, you know, history, like this really close history and use of it. So it is something that is, we're bringing it back and um, kind of playing with it and seeing how best to use it. And that's uh, something that I love about herbalism. Like there's just no, there's hardly ever the one way to do things. And more than that is, you know, finding out what works for you and how your relationship with the plant develops. Someone else might be like, oh, I love the alcohol extract. I only work with the tincture because that's what works for them, but it is not necessarily what works for everyone. So I love that you found your, you know, you're continually finding your relationship with New England Aster and and um, that the glycerite works so well for you. And um, yeah, and it, you found a way to incorporate it into your life in a way that is a tradition, is a meaningful tradition and also powerful medicine. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that like I've worked with a number of other people who, um, you know, I used to do only alcohol-based tinctures. And then I started working, you know, as I started working with the public as an herbalist, um, a number of people are in like AA and things like that. And so suddenly even a small amount of al alcohol isn't appropriate for certain people. So, you know, I always do one of both, but, you know, I, I always want to have some of this because this is great medicine for a lot of people. A lot of people have seasonal allergies and asthma and, you know, and I know I can give this to anyone without worrying um, about whether or not, you know, they can have alcohol or not. So that's part of why I I really like this particular version. Yeah, thank you for sharing that recipe and explaining it as well. This message is for the listeners. As you probably know by now, I love to share recipes when we talk about these plants. Recipes are a wonderful way for you to get involved and create your own experience with herbs. Because it's one thing to hear cool facts about a plant, but an entirely other thing to form your own relationship with this plant through observing, tending, and a course, tasting. Dana has given us a super simple way to work with this New England Aster that retains its fresh qualities without using alcohol. You'll definitely want to check out her recipe for New England Aster Glycerite. You can download your recipe card using the link in the video description. On that same page, you'll also find show notes, including direct links to Dana's offerings and a transcript of this interview. Sure. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about New England, Esther? Um, I mean, I could share, you know, I, I guess just thinking a little bit, you know, this kind of gets into, I know we were going to talk a little bit about projects, um, thinking about sort of, there's always to me, a, not only a physical characteristic of a plant, but also sort of an energetic one. Um, so we talked a little bit about that, like that opening and that expansion. And I do, I do find like sort of energetically, this medicine allows for that. It's sort of almost like opens us up to possibilities because sometimes if our um you know if your chest is tight and your your clothing and your 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 your, 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 your you feel like your throat is closed or you're not able to take a full breath you know if you think about you know, even what's happened in the world in the last you know two years how we've all been like holding our breaths or, or holding our breath and it's almost like when you're holding your breath, you're not able to do anything else. You're almost like in a place of like constriction. And one of the things that I find that Aster sort of does is sort of allows for that, allows for that breath and allows for that expansion, allows for that, like, um, that possibility to occur. And so, you know, if, if people are into more sort of the energetic qualities of plants and maybe you want to work with it, you know, you don't necessarily take it, even just sit with it or, you know, put a drawing of it in your house or a photograph mm -hmm. of it, you know, thinking about the sort of the energetic medicine of that plant in addition to the physical, um, I think can be useful. So that's the other piece I'd like to share. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Well, speaking of projects, it's always fun to hear what herbalists have going on. Everyone has such unique ways of working with plants and bringing it forth into the world. So what do you have going on these days? Um, well, I wanted to share two possible things. So, of course, um, you know, he would mention my book. Um, this is Sacred Actions. And this is... Um, <laughs> um, this is my new book. It came out in May. And I think that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of herbal philosophy and there's a lot of permaculture in the book. And the whole philosophy, um, which is really aligned, in my opinion, with herbalism, is like, how do we live every day in a sacred manner that honors the earth? 
So, you know, I think a lot of people like in their minds are like, I love the land. I, I love the earth. I, I practice herbalism. Maybe I practice, you know, something like Druidry, like I practice. And this book is really like, well, how do we do that? And how do we sort of live every day and move through the wheel of the year doing so? So I kind of wanted to share that project because it's like really new and, you know, it's exciting to have it out in the world. And that's how we connected. Mm hmm. I want to add something about it as well. So I was thrilled to find that you had uh, written this book. I'd previously known of you through Jim and your beautiful artistry. And then when I found that you had this book, I was really excited. And um, I was just reading the chapter on Samhain. And I loved so much of what you had to share then about connecting with sacred plants and the personal relationship there, which I think is absolutely integral to our um, the world of herbalism and really where herbs come to life for me, mm -hmm. um, instead mm -hmm. of them just being like a pharmacy, but instead like a deep connection. One thing I just thought was interesting is in the Samhain chapter, you talk about incense uh, this time of year and, and the practice of that and making our own um, burning bundles or incense and smoke uh, medicine. And that is actually one of the, the most common way that I've worked with New England Aster is I always included in my burning bundles. Mm -hmm. I don't know, as you say in the book, you know, it's a flowering plant. It does have some aromatics. I don't know that it I don't know if it really brings a whole bunch to the bundles because there's lots of herbs in there, but it's so pretty. <laughs> so it has to go in and it is wonderful long medicine. And I just thought that was like a fun, like crossover of just, you know, for the chapter on salad and smoke medicine and you talking about New England Aster today. So yeah. I just wanted to share yeah. that. And, and also I'll share too, since we're talking about your book, it's such a great book for seeing the enchantment and beauty and magic out there through that personal experience, the practicalness, and uh, so much wonderful information on sustainability and just enrichment of our lives. So if people are looking for a way to walk through the seasons of the year and really find practices that resonate with them, uh, such a great book on so many levels for that. So thank you for writing it. I'm so glad it's out in the world. It took me forever to write. I'm so glad it's out in the world too. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like these projects always um, have a mind of their own and take whatever time they're going to take. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, um, actually, because New England Astro shows up, is my Plant Spirit Oracle project. Um, so this is um, Plant Spirit Oracle. We, we try to do no plastic, so it has a nice little paper sleeve. And um, you see, I've got the ghost pipe on here. Um, and actually, in this, it's a... 47 card plant medicine deck um, of all sorts of things. And there's the Aster card. Oh, so beautiful. And so, um, yeah, so this is, um, this was a project I spent, mm, <laughs> five, there's Burdock, there's Burdock. <laughs> probably about five years painting, um, getting to know the various plants on my landscape, not only as an herbalist, but as an artist, and sort of thinking about how they might be used, not only for like for both spirit medicine and for physical medicine, has an accompany accompanying book, which has a, like recipes and divination and how to work, like if you wanted to learn more about like how to work with plants on a spiritual level or how to journey and get to like to learn directly from the spirit of the plant. Um, this is a, this is a, I think something that people might be interested in. It was certainly fun to create and you know, there's all kinds of, all kinds of plants, like Sir St. John's wort one of my favorites Ooh, um, that's lovely. so yeah lots of you know wild yam <laughs> um so you know so if that might be something else that people that are really interested in herbs um would be interested in and i always find you know because i am an artist we're, we're in my art studio right now um <laughs> so i'm talking to you from i always find that sort of it's really interesting to think about the relationship between our creative practices and our and herbalism and um thinking about that sort of synthesis between how do we how do we engage with plants in different ways? So how do we make medicine? How do we create music or art or maybe dance even that embodies that plant? And th those are just so many different ways of like building that connection. Mm -hmm. And I always love seeing other artists or other people who have created things and how, or even the great tinctures and purchasing those from people and saying, well, how did I, how did they think about this plant versus how did I think about this plant? So I did want to share that because I think it's uh, I think it's a fun project that people might, people might enjoy also. A fun, beautiful project. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, also inspired by Jim McDonald. I, I give him so much credit. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> like, like his understanding of Hawthorne totally made it into this book, but I totally acknowledged him. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs>
Well, Dana, that brings us to our last question, which is something I'm asking everybody in season two. And that question is, what's something you've learned or experienced in your herbal journey that surprised you? Hmm. Such a good question. Um, I think that when I started my herbal journey, I saw it as an alternative to allopathic medicine in the sense that a plant could do X thing, right? So, so in some cases, like in the case of New England Aster, like, yes, this plant totally replaced multiple asthma medications. So that makes sense. But I think that one of the deeper lessons that I've learned over time actually comes from, pull it up again, uh, the ghost pipe right here, um, among many other plants. And that is that um, if all that we think about is replacing one plant with like one conventional medicine with a plant, which I think is a lot of ways that people who are new to herbalism think about it. Like, oh, I have this thing. What can a plant do that instead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we see that a lot with like elderberry, we see that with St. John's wort, like a lot of the common plants that echinacea, a lot of the common plants that people kind of go for and they're like, oh, maybe I'll take this, you know? Um, and I think that that, um, it's not, it's not, it's like a gateway way of thinking, right? It's a good introductory way of thinking, but plants can do so much more and offer us so many incredible benefits that are not at all like they have nothing to do with allopathic medicine, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I and I point here to to ghost pipe as a really good example of that. Ghost pipe doesn't do anything that any conventionally produced drug can do. It just doesn't, you know. It offers distance and perspective, and that is, you know, when I think about hawthorn, sure, hawthorn can obviously replace certain heart medications or treat hearts deeply, but hawthorn has a whole bunch of additional qualities. Sort of like what I was talking about with New England Aster, that opening quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's almost like plant knowledge requires and, and encourages us to think about what is medicine in a much more broad way? What is healing in a much more broad way? And the plants work on every level of us. So they work on our physical bodies, which is where we're starting, right? They work on our emotional our, our hearts, our emotions, they work on our minds, they work on our spirits, they work on our connections with the world and with others. And as soon as we recognize that that is all plant medicine, every part of it, then I feel like we can really start to understand these plants and that every plant we work with, um, and some of them may not be good for our physical bodies. So like one of my favorite plants in the world is poison ivy. <laughs> Have it on me right now, there it is. <laughs> and Poison ivy is not great for my physical body, but she is such a powerful teacher in terms of me paying attention, me not looking at my phone when I go into the woods, me actually learning deep observation skills and cultivating a sense of awareness, which is critical if I'm going to be a good herbalist. And so that's, I think, the one of the most powerful lessons that I feel like I've I've learned as as an herbalist, and it's and and it keeps resonating. Like every time you know you think you you think you have a handle on something, then the plant's like, all right, let's go deeper and let's learn another another lesson. And so you know that idea of lifelong learning in all of these different dimensions. You shared that so beautifully. Thank you so much, Dana. That is really for me that the heart of medicine and where this really comes to life. And obviously if we have a problem and an herb fixes it, just kind of like A plus B equals C kind of thing, obviously that can be really cool when we have a problem and we want it to be fixed, but it's such a surface level aspect of herbalism. And you just really shared that so beautifully in terms of how many deeper levels there are unending, as you say, <laughs> because the plants just are ready to keep bringing us deeper and deeper as we go throughout that path. Yeah. And I think like, if we think about that, like, what do we really need in the world right now? Like the plants are ready to give it to us. You know, we need reconnection with the land. We need humans to learn that this land sustains us and that this land provides everything to us. And if we can learn those lessons, which the plants are ready to teach us, then I think that we can, you know, really rise to some of the challenges that we're facing as a civilization and as a world and how do we live differently, you know, and how do we honor this land and, and find ways of being able to cohabitate in peace and balance. And to me, that starts with something like understanding that the plant has all of these different aspects and that really can fulfill many of those needs. And so sort of part of like the way I think about like, how do we maybe solve some of the challenges we face today? And it's, you know, like the plants seem to be a really good place to be for that. So true. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And thanks for sharing New England Aster with all of us. Absolutely. 
Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Dana's New England Aster Glycerite. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also visit Dana directly at thedruidsgarden.com. Before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your thoughts about this interview and your relationship with New England Aster leave your comments below. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.